feels a bit strange. I haven't done this for a while, so. Uh, <laughs> but it is good to be back and share God's word together. Uh, before we do that, let's uh, join together in prayer. Our Father, we do come before you and ask for your help to give us understanding of your truth as we hear it spoken and proclaimed. May we hear the voice of our Saviour. Give us ears to hear and in hearing to believe and to receive and rest on Jesus as he has offered to us and proclaimed to us in the gospel. And this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I don't know about you. Uh, some of you are keen gardeners. I'm not a gardener. But I have occasionally watched Gardening Australia with Susan on a Friday night. I'm still none the wiser, but it seemed to take a bit of interest. And yesterday, if you look at the study windows, a lot of work and the working bee went on yesterday. You can see Kemp's really well-designed bushes that now let more light into the study, which is, uh, which is a help. Uh, when, I, when I read this uh, passage this week, it took me back to uh, first year of high school. Um, we were misbehaving, me and another guy misbehaving in, 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 in the class, so we were given a clout around the ear and sent out to uh, the gardener, the school gardener, and he gave us the task to pull up these weeds. Well, of course, we hardly knew the difference between a weed and a plant. We thought we'd done a pretty good job, but he came back and he, uh, it, it wasn't good. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, plants and vegetables and so on missing, so that's not my that's not my forte, but that is what uh, we're looking here at, the weeds and the wheat. Uh, last week, Trevor uh, took us through the uh, parable of the sower. And uh, here we come now to a different kind of parable concerning the wheat or the tares or the wheat and the weeds, if you like. It's also a parable of sowing. Uh, from verse 24, but it's different from the first parable. Uh, wherever the word of God was sown, it would fall in four different kinds of soils, uh, four kinds of hearts, and one where it would take root. Uh, and that continues to happen wherever the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed and the good seed of the word. It's been happening uh, for over 20 centuries and continues to be effective, the gospel seed is sown and the gospel is proclaimed and the kingdom is extended. And so it's fruitful lives are produced by the good seed of the word of God. Now, in this parable, we're, we're in turn taken that the Lord has, uh, has brought about these who have been scattered, those who had believed, and we're now looking at the soils. Here we're looking at the whole field, which is the world. Jesus says that uh, the field is the world where God is to be made known. These sons of the kingdom uh, are put where God wants them to be. And that's true of you and I, isn't it? Uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're a child of God, a son or daughter of God in the kingdom of faith, God puts us in places where he wants us to be. It's like Acts 17, 26. It says something roughly like this. It's the time we live in, where we live, uh, has been ordained by God. And so Jesus began scattering men committed uh, to the word of truth in order to produce more people who would become uh, like Christ. And at the same time, Satan scatters lies and evil and wickedness to produce uh, ungodliness and sinfulness. So they both grow together in this parable, the wheat and the weeds. And it seems that uh, this, what we call the wheat or the tares, uh, was called, I think, 
the term was darnel. It, it looked almost identical to wheat, but you couldn't tell that until it was fully grown. And at that point, then, there's this separation. See verse 24, 25. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So the plants came up and bore grain. Then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. And so everywhere where God's word uh, and God's truth is proclaimed, the enemy is equally busy. There's a separation that takes place when the gospel of Christ is spoken. Let's just quickly observe a number of things in this passage. That the sower is the son of man. Uh, Jesus himself, verse 37. Uh, the sowing is ongoing, it's continual. The field, we're told, verse 38, is the world. And uh, uh, then the good seed are the children of the kingdom, verse 38. They belong to God, they're called the children of the kingdom. They live in one world while they belong to another world. And that's like what it is for the Christian. We live in a broken world, but we ultimately belong. We're exiles here. We ultimately belong to another world. Verse 38, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. So there's only two camps. There are those who are the sons of the evil one, and there are those who are the sons of God. The enemy, verse 39, is, of course, the devil. The reapers are the angels, verse 39. And the harvest, verse 40, is the judgment day that we heard a little bit about in the kids' talk. And it's at this point that we get the most information and the most important truth that, that Jesus indicates that there will be a day of judgment. The harvest will happen. And the weeds and the wheat will be separated. You see that there in verse 40 following. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so, so will it be at the close of the age. For the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a solemn parable. And we're going to look at it uh, then just under these simple headings. Two sores, two seeds, and two responses. So we want to zoom in a bit more. Uh, the two sores, uh, of course, Satan is the one who sows weeds. We read, we read that in uh, verse 27, 28. You see it again in verse 39. Uh, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So wherever the word of God is proclaimed, wherever the things of God are spoken, you can be sure that the enemy is also at work. We see it right at the beginning of the Bible, don't we, in Genesis 3. How the serpent comes and... Uh, and suggests that God is cheating Adam and Eve, that God is not being kind to them. And they go and they eat of the fruit, and sin entered the world. You get the same idea in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. It's one of spiritual warfare. Finally, brothers, put on the whole armor of God, that you're able to stand against the wicked. So we're, we're in a spiritual warfare when the gospel is being proclaimed and when we're seeking to live our lives for the glory of God. It's a reminder that true Christian believers 
live, are living out our trust and our faith in the context of a broken and godless world, increasingly. And we're called to live for Christ in a war zone. It's not peacetime. It's never peacetime for the Christian believer. Where conflict with sin is, Satan is real. Jesus is our captain. We know that he's victorious because he has overcome the evil one. The Gettys have a song, I can't remember the actual title, but there's words in it that go like this, uh, that we hear the call of Christ our captain. Jesus is the sower of good seed. Verse 38. The field is the world, the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. So by the power of God's spirit, the seed of the word is planted in the lives of people. It is Jesus alone uh, who has the power and the authority as he, as he rose from the dead, as he left us the great treasures of the gospel. It is Jesus alone who saves, saves us, who makes us, who keeps us, who uses us in his work of the kingdom. Whoever you are this morning, if you're in Christ, that is what he's done for you. And you face this battle with the forces of evil that are, that are aimed at derailing the kingdom of God, which of course is laughable. The kingdom of heaven is secure. And if you know and are in Christ, you are secure. And it can't derail the kingdom plans of God. For over 2,000 years, he's been planting and harvesting people. People's lives changed by the transforming power of the gospel. Rescuing countless millions of people from all over the world. And it's happening right now as you and I sit here. Somewhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. Possibly. There are those who are coming to a knowledge of Christ. Martin Luther, we just had a, a great old hymn there at the start. Martin Luther's hymn, A Safe Stronghold Our God Is Still. Listen to the words. Though this world by devils filled should threaten to undo us, we shall not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim. We tremble, not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. And that little word is the gospel the power of the gospel unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is not a method or a mechanism that is offered to us. The gospel is a person, the Son of God, the Son of Man, who has rescued us from a lost world. And so the parable of the wheat and the weeds is saying that salvation belongs to the Lord. It is saying that it is Jesus alone that people need. It is Jesus alone we are to, to run to and to cling to. And as I've said today, all around the world, there are people from all cultures who are running to Jesus for mercy, for pardon, for forgiveness. There are people being transformed by the powerful word of the gospel. And if you haven't yet run to him this morning, let me urge you to do so. To him, who the song says, Jesus strong 
and kind, full of mercy and truth. But there is an enemy, isn't there? So there's two sores. There's the devil and there's the son of God. There are two kinds of seed. Uh, verse 37, he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom and the weeds are the sons of the evil one. So the good seed is sown by the Son of Man. It's happening right now as you and I are here in this place and in other churches around about us and wherever God's word has been spoken. The good seed are called the sons of the kingdom. and The bad seed are the weeds, the sons of the evil one. And that is the reality in every situation, in every congregation, in every place, there's a conflict of spiritual opposition. What separates the weeds from the wheat, what separates churchgoers from true believers, and only God knows, is the bearing of good fruit. Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Spiritual fruit is seen in how you love Christ. It's seen in how you love his people, how you love his word, how you love his day, how you love his service. That's the fruit. It's seen in keeping short accounts with God and with one another. It's seen in how we are quick to forgive those who sin against us. It's seen in how we own our own sin. And it's seen in how we flee regularly and constantly and dependently on the Lord Jesus. It's seen by looking to the cross for pardon and peace and cleansing. And so it's a challenge, isn't it? We all ask ourselves, is our Christianity a matter of words? Or can it be seen in fruitful living, a fruitful harvest, increasingly looking more like Jesus? That's the test. The weeds, we're told, or the bad seed is sown by the sons of the evil one. This seed, as we said, is known as darno. It's a kind of weed that is identical to wheat all the way through until the harvest time. And then the wickedness is finally Revealed. All causes of sin and all lawbreakers are rounded up and face the justice of God. See, justice is not always immediate, is it? Righteousness may seem to be losing, but will in the end be victorious because there is a true judgment. And therefore, we'll be careful how to judge. You and I can't predict who is truly the Lord's and who is not. We obviously, there's the aspect of fruit, but ultimately, Jesus says to them, no, don't, don't, don't pull up the weeds lest you disturb and perhaps it is unhelpful to those who are believers. So there's a time. And then thirdly, there's two responses to the seed that is sown. The first is seen in the servants in verse 28. 
He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, less gathering the weeds. Here's the thing, less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. So he says, you wait, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into the barn. So they're zealous to take action. And Jesus says, no, wait. Don't be hasty. Don't be overzealous. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. So again, there's warnings here for us. We need to remember that God is not like us, nor does things the way that we would want to do them. God works in a way sometimes in all our lives that makes no sense to us. We shake our heads perhaps at times. We're, we're not only surprised but overwhelmed sometimes. What God does and how he does it. If you look at the, the, the history of his people. I mean, who would have chosen Israel? Of all people. And yet he goes to this little known people and he chose them. And then he sends his only son into a world who had no time for him. And he sent him in the form of a helpless baby. Not a king in a palace, but a baby in a manger. And he calls the first followers of Jesus some of them were, uh, you know, you, some of them were maybe more intelligent than others, but they were, for by and large, maybe largely uneducated, un, not much influence. You think of the people that he gathered around him, it, it seems today you wouldn't do it. And then, to end it all by dying on a cross, God is not like us. He does things differently. And then he raised him up again. God often works in ways that makes us shake our heads. And remember also, we're told out here, that delayed judgment is still judgment. It's not that you get off with it. We hear it all the time, don't we, in the news, there's, there's no justice and so on. And a sense of lack of judgment can cause, I suppose, all kinds of feelings. One can be apathy, the other can be really anger. Where's the justice? Well, it's coming in God's time. Delayed judgment is still judgment. You know those words in Romans 2, 4, the kindness, the kindness of God is meant to lead us to repentance. To repentance. The kindness of God. The kindness of God in giving you time if you're not yet a Christian. To lead you to repentance. And that's true of those of us here who whose lives have been changed by Christ and the gospel. We're not to make the mistake of thinking that delayed judgment means no judgment. In Matthew 13, God is not surprised, is he, about the weeds in the field? He's going to make it right. He will separate those who are his and those who are not his. 
but in his time and in his way. And what you and I are called to do is to trust and obey. See, the problem is that the servants of the sowers can't always distinguish. We can't always distinguish between the wheat and the weeds. The point is that only the Son of Man can see the heart. Only God can look into the heart. Only Jesus can make a safe and true determination of the situation. And then there is this warning of coming judgment. It's coming. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He has ears to hear. Let him hear. See again. There's these two kinds of responses. Isn't there? There's one that leads to judgment. And there's one that leads. To pardon. And forgiveness. The son of man will send his angels. And they will gather out of his kingdom. All causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all the sin and all the lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. Judgment Day is a reality. It's pictured here as a kind of fiery furnace. It's a reality that everyone, however much they look like wheat, still remain weeds. So what we do know from Scripture is that hell is a place to be shunned and heaven is a place to be gained. It's a place to run to. Matthew Henry, commenting on that expression, weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says that it describes comfortless sorrow, an incurable indignation at God themselves and one another, which will be the endless torture of the damned souls. Solemn. It's a terrible picture. It's one that any thinking person would want to avoid. And you know, no one taught the doctrine of hell more clearly, more regularly, than Jesus, the most loving, caring being that ever there was. He taught about it in order that people might flee from it. Jesus himself faced the very horror of the cross, went to the very depths. He knew better than anyone the horrors of hell. That's why he said so much about it. There is a hell to be shunned. You know, at the end of John Bunyan's uh, book on Pilgrim's Progress, there's this staggering statement that he makes. And he says this, Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gate of heaven as well, as from the city of destruction. There's a way to hell (laughs) from the very gates of heaven. You might be there and you might be peeking in. And yet there's a gate as well from the city of destruction. This passage makes the point 
that there's a wonderful heaven to gain. And there's, a wonder, there's a, an awesome hell to shun. He who has ears, let him hear. We must never underestimate the power of the gospel. That the Son of God comes to the creation as a helpless baby. He lives a sinful, sinless life. He's abandoned. He's killed in a way that was cursed by God. He's buried. But he rises again. That's the truth. He rises again to continue radically changing people's hearts, people's families, people's lives. We must never underestimate the, the power of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. God wants his children to be salt and light in our broken world. The cross should make us more mindful of how we define success in the Christian life and in the kingdom of God. We should be careful how we define the success of God's blessings and even our failures. It might look great on the outside, the real goal for the people of God is to follow Paul's words, Philippians 3. But to know him, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Or the words of Micah 6 verse 8, he has told you, man, he has told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? So, as we close, hear these words again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Where is your path leading? What do you understand of the gospel? What do you understand of eternal judgment? That Christ has already endured on our behalf. That we need not face that terrible experience. So Jesus asks us, what will be your destiny? Where do you stand this morning? Is the seed of the word of God growing in your heart? Are you taking it to heart? Are you a son or daughter of the kingdom? Or are you a son or daughter of the evil one who deceives, who spreads lies? Jesus calls us to be careful about how we evaluate success when it comes to the kingdom of God. It is his kingdom, not our kingdom. He is the king that we all need and the king who is ready to receive you as you come to him. Let me pray. Our Father, we have thought of solemn things and joyful things, blessed things and cursed things. We thank you for the wonder of your truth. Thank you that your word searches us, that your word gives us a clear perspective and makes us see life as it really is. Would you continue to teach us to value the truth of the Bible the truth revealed to us by the one who loved us enough to give himself for us. Even Jesus who died for our sakes and who now lives to make us more like him 
who loved us and gave himself for us. And may we, by your grace, be people who love your truth. Lord, make us useful in making you known to those who don't yet know you, even those of our own flesh and blood. And may many be changed by the gospel of God into sons and daughters of God in the kingdom of heaven. And help us, Lord, at all times to see ourselves as we are in relation to you. For Jesus' sake, amen.